Okay, our next speaker is um, Eric Holm from the Naval Surface Warfare Centre in the US. Um, Eric has, as um, Jeff mentioned, has worked in this space for a long time and um, always has great insights into, into these areas of you know, hull fouling and its impacts and, and other associated issues. So, Eric, please come up. I want to point out that originally this talk was supposed to be given by my colleague Liz Hasselbeck. She couldn't be here today because she's in San Diego actually taking delivery of the test apparatus that we'll get to at the end of this talk. Um, so uh, she apologizes for not being able to be here. I'd also like to take a moment to set some context for this. Christiani set up this nice dichotomy in uh, reasons why one might be concerned with cleaning between biosecurity and water quality. The concern in this talk is mainly having to do with water quality and not the biosecurity side, although the device we're developing could be uh, used to approach questions that are associated with with biosecurity. But for us, these water quality uh, questions, they're really tightly associated with the interaction between cleaning tools and the type of coating they're using. And if you heard my talk yesterday, I noted that uh, the issues that the U.S. Navy has with uh, biofouling largely stem from the fact that we're using commercial off-the-shelf coating systems and we have to try and stretch them out to this eight to 12 year dry docking cycle, which Jeff also mentioned. So in that sort of uh, scenario, the interaction between a cleaning tool and the coating is extremely important. You wanna have a tool that's very well matched to the nature of your coating so that at the end of 12 years, you actually have some coating left on your hull. So when we go to implement a new coating, we need to understand something about how that coating is going to respond to cleaning. Uh, we actually haven't implemented a new coating in our fleet in about 30 years. So we have a very good idea of how our fairly ancient anti-fouling coating technologies interact with our cleaning tools. But for some of the new technologies that are out there, which promise potentially to perform better than our current techs, we don't have such a good idea. A lot of this will be review from talks that were earlier today and other talks that you've heard, so I'm gonna go through it pretty fast. The primary means of uh, biofouling control for ships, uh, for ship owners, whether you're a commercial ship owner, operator, or one for defense is through coatings. The sort of environmental issues that are associated with this have to do first with air quality, and this is volatile organic compounds that are released when the coating is applied in the dry dock. But secondly, also biocide inputs. This is more of the, the water quality issue. Uh, as the coating, if it's an anti-fouling coating in particular, leaches biocides or repellents into the water column. The second sort of issue is associated with coating performance. Uh, coating performance, as uh, many uh, presenters have noted, is tied uh, very tightly with operational profile. If your operational profile doesn't match the function of the coating, you potentially have a biofouling problem. Also with operational area, Jeff mentioned uh, resistant biofouling organisms. If you happen to be operating largely in an area where things are resistant, you're going to end up with a biofouling problem. I'm not gonna to deal too much with niche areas, but they represent their own sorts of problems. When a biofouling control coating fails, your only option for restoring vessel performance or even coating performance is to clean the hull. You can do this in dry dock if you want. That's pretty expensive, it's time consuming, and depending on the size of your vessel is possibly limited by dry dock availability. Or you can do the cleaning in the water. Uh, that's relatively inexpensive and it's quite quick. Uh, and there are a number of different tools available to uh, do that. The US Navy has a lot of experience with in-water hull cleaning. We've been doing it since the 1970s, really since the first commercially viable cleaning, in-water cleaning systems became available 
the Navy started investigating them. These pictures, in fact, come from a tech report that the Navy put out on in-water cleaning in the 1970s. The thing I find amazing here is the top picture is scamp, and it really hasn't changed in almost 50 years now. We still use that as our main cleaning device. Anyway, in the 70s and 80s, uh, cleaning in the Navy was implemented to extend service life of vinyl copper-based coatings. We used rotating brush tools, and here the goal was to remove uh, copper salts that formed on the outsides of these coatings and prevented the release of further copper to prevent fouling from occurring. And this, the cleaning plan that was implemented extended service life of these coatings from one to two years to about three to four years. In the 80s and 90s, the Navy, U.S. Navy implemented ablative copper-based coatings. Again, we are using rotating brush tools here to keep them clean. Uh, in this case, rather than removing uh, cupric salts from the surface of the coating, the idea was to remove the leach layer at the surface of the coating, a layer of paint that had no copper in it anymore because the copper had leached out of the surface of the coating and uh, thus to restore the leaching of uh, copper from the paint. And here we were able to get in first case uh, extension of coating life and thus dry docking cycle from three to five years to five to seven years and ultimately out to eight to 12 years. Our hull cleaning practices, we use primarily rotating brush tools, uh, in particular the SCAMP, although there is some limited use of water jets. Jeff actually already did a nice quick job of reviewing uh, the more or less rules that we have for initiating a hull cleaning. So I'm not going to go into that. The bottom line is these rules all have to be backed up by an inspection. Uh, if your ship isn't performing correctly, you can ask for an inspection. You can't ask necessarily for a cleaning. If the inspection verifies that you've got a biofouling problem, uh, then you can get your hull cleaned. Uh, and Jeff already gave you the trigger criteria there. Benefits of in-water hull cleaning, it's extremely cost-effective means of restoring vessel operating efficiency, and it can even restore the efficacy of the uh, biofouling control coating. We find that our coatings uh, work pretty well for the first three to five years that are on a ship. At that point, they might need to be cleaned. After that, we get another two to three years out of them before they need to get cleaned again. So uh, it does restore the performance of the coating. However, there are a lot of unintended consequences, which many of the speakers have gone through. Today, there's discharge of paint components, including biocides or repellents and particulates from the paint itself. There's an impact on coating integrity, efficacy, or service life. Every time you clean the coating, you take off a little bit of paint, that, and if you're talking about a fouling release coating, you may change the surface properties and reduce the efficacy of that coating. Every time you do this, you have an effect on the service life of the paint. Uh, for biosecurity purposes, there's the potential for a release of attached biofouling, and all of these un unintended consequences ultimately <coughs> result in increased regulatory scrutiny for the, uh, for the process in general. And this uh, generates some issues for finding the right solution for controlling biofouling on the hull. Environmental regulations circled in green here, uh, addressing both the use of particular kinds of methods like anti-fouling coatings and underwater ship husbandry, such as in-water cleaning, create this sort of tension uh, uh, in, uh, in regulations and uh, resolving that tension is what's needed in order to uh, find the right biofouling control solution. So we have some knowledge gaps uh, that uh, currently make it difficult to resolve that tension. Chris and, jo and Eugene's uh, recent paper in uh, Frontiers in Marine Science documented those, those knowledge gaps pretty well. We don't have a good understanding when it comes to in-water hull cleaning 
uh, what the nature is of the environmental inputs, whether they be chemical or biological, what the impact is on the coatings in terms of thickness, damage, and subsequent efficacy, and how those impacts change depending on the type of coating, depending on the type of cleaning tool and how it interacts with the coating, and as affected by the cleaning strategy, whether you're doing a reactive cleaning or a proactive cleaning or something like grooming. And so what we've been trying to do is develop a standard method for efficiently testing cleaning tools and measuring their impacts and environmental inputs in order for us to, in particular, understand the nature of these chemical inputs to the environment and in particular these impacts on coatings so we can take our coatings out to 8 to 12 year dry docking cycles. What I want to go through now is a number of the sort of standard and very much non-standard methods that we've used over the years to examine some of these types of questions and as many of the speakers today have noted, uh, there aren't really any good existing standard methods, documented standard methods for doing this kind of work. There is one that you can use on a very small scale. It's associated with this alcometer washability tester documented in a number of ASTM and, and ISO methods. And the advantage to this method is it produces very high quality data. The data are reproducible. The disadvantage is the method really has almost no relationship to what goes on on the side of a hull. The focus here of this method was to test what happens to house paints, in effect, uh, when you tried to clean them. Uh, the focus is on architectural coatings, not on biofoul and control coatings. There's really no easy way to adapt the relevant cleaning tools for ship hulls to this device, and there's no ability to measure environmental inputs, but you can get a sort of ranking of uh, how various types of paints might respond to uh, the abrasion of a some kind of standard cleaning tool. We've done on-ship evaluations, which were covered a lot today. Um, uh, here we um, generally are looking to quantify decrease in paint thickness with uh, with cleaning by various tools using uh, standard paint thickness gauges. The advantage, is here, the advantage here is that you can apply the full scale cleaning tools. So the actual device as it would be used by a diver. The disadvantages here are the ones I've listed plus everything that Dan McCleary said uh, earlier today. The list is pretty much huge. These things are quite difficult to do and in particular if you're uh, interested in the environmental inputs, it's often quite difficult to, to measure those. Uh, we've done uh, another sort of non-standard test that allows us to apply uh, full-scale cleaning tools. This was with panels and involved mounting the panels into a essentially a fake side of a ship. We've done this in a number of different ways, but in this one we had a window in a large piece of sheet metal in which we could place panels of different uh, kinds and apply the tools at full scale, take the panels back out of the water. In this case, we were testing fouling release coatings under cleaning by brush tools. We could examine those panels at the microscopic level and see how they were affected by cleaning. Uh, the beauty part about this sort of test is the data that are generated are of extremely high quality. We can repeatedly sample these panels at the exact same spot over and over again. In this particular test, I think we cleaned them on the order of five times. And there's no risk to the ship. You can put a, a new kind of coating technology in here, run a coating or cleaning device over it. If you destroy the coating, that's great. You haven't affected the ship at all disadvantage, much higher cost than testing on the side of a ship, and again, very limited ability to measure environmental inputs. Lastly, uh, there's a method that our colleagues out at the Naval uh, Information Warfare Center in San Diego have used many times to investigate inputs of biocides following, uh, following cleaning uh, of anti-fouling coatings on leisure craft. 
Uh, this is a handheld device, mounts a little cleaning tool on a crank, uh, encloses a small body of water in a cylinder. You turn the crank a certain number of times in your uh, whatever's designated in the protocol, and then you can sample the water in, that's uh, captured in the cylinder. And the goal here was to look at environmental inputs of biocides at, uh, as a function of that surface refreshment. The advantages here were is it, it directly addresses biocide inputs. And in the case of this device, uh, exactly mimic, it, mimic the, uh, the sorts of handheld tools that uh, divers at marinas were typically using to clean small craft uh, in San Diego in particular. The disadvantages were uh, we can't really replicate full-scale cleaning tools that are used on large vessels for this, and it wasn't focused at all on uh, impacts to the coatings. So we had these, these methods in hand, and we kind of knew how they behaved, but we identify the fact that we needed something that could go quite a bit further, and that's what we're working on now. Uh, in order to address these weaknesses, we needed a tool where we could apply to test surfaces, essentially painted panels. Uh, the cleaning devices that are used on full scale on a ship in the same way that they would be applied to a ship. Um, and essentially what we developed for this is a trough that mounts a cleaning tool on the bottom of it. I don't know that my pointer is still working. The magic here goes on in this little uh, brush drive area that's marked here. There's a sump there, and into that sump we've essentially imported all the guts of, in our first case scenario, a scamp. So we have all the hydraulic motors for a scamp. We can mount the brushes that go on a scamp. We can run this the exact same way that a scamp runs. We run a panel over it. The whole device is made out of materials that have been chosen so that we don't get any contamination of the water in this trough. We can then sample the entire body of water here for uh, dissolved metals, paint chips, uh, any item that might be produced by cleaning of the hull. Um, here's a, a close-in drawing of the mounting for the brush. Um, the cleaning head here, the brush mount, is adaptable for multiple tool types. It's currently configured to handle brushes, but it's designed to handle anything from other sorts of brushes than those currently used by the scamp, to water jets, to potentially even grooming devices, such as what Jeff is testing. In our initial test, we're going to be looking at the effects of seven different brush types on three different coating types. Uh, we can quantify very closely changes in paint thickness or surface properties. We can capture the entire volume of water of the trough in order to measure dissolved metals, particulate matter, and we're currently focusing on copper and zinc. So we can measure those directly, but because we're also measuring paint thickness, we can uh, compare those concentrations to the change in thickness of the paint that we're getting. We're currently not looking to analyze biological inputs. Uh, typically, we're not going to be exposing these panels for long enough to actually collect any biology beyond biofilms on them, but there's really no reason why you couldn't do that in the future. You'd probably want to start off with an inert coating like an epoxy to do it. So in conclusion, in-water hull cleaning is a cost-effective means of restoring coating and chip performance. But regulators are challenged. Regulations on coatings might conflict with regulations on cleaning, and we need to find an appropriate balance between the benefits of cleaning and, and uh, whatever the chemistry is in the coating and the costs associated with uh, environmental impacts. In water cleaning impacts coatings. We currently don't have the greatest understanding of uh, what those impacts are. There are definitely impacts to paint thickness. We know that it can range from almost nothing out to on the order of 100 microns of paint loss each time one cleans. There are obviously environmental impacts. They're sometimes very difficult to, or environmental inputs that are sometimes difficult to quantify. 
uh, improved understanding of those inputs and the impacts to coatings may aid regulators. And we believe, as I said, that a standardized tool could help inform the problem. And we're looking to develop that. And ultimately, we feel like we could use it on the biological side as well, but that's still to be determined. That's all I have. I'd like to acknowledge funding from the DOD's ESTCP program and also to our collaborators at Battelle, and thanks for listening.